Hello and welcome to our Zoom talk, Pandemic, Famine and War, How Millers Respond in Times of Crisis, presented by Friends of Windmill Gardens. Here beginneth the Miller's Tale. I care for nobody, no not I, and nobody cares for me. Some of you may recognise this refrain from the Johnny Miller, a cheerful fellow who you may remember from your school songbook. He's also known as the Miller of D, and represents a common perception of Millers as self-sufficient types who work alone and look after number one every time. This is a stereotype which goes all the way back to the Canterbury Tales, where Chaucer's drunken Miller, who you see on the screen, was so rude and belligerent that the host tried to bump him off the Canterbury Tales rota after he fell off his horse. He's a surly churl who's always fighting and cheats his customers, something Millers have been accused of from time immemorial. I'm glad to say that I don't know any Millers like that, and I've met quite a few. My name is Anne, and I'm a volunteer at Brixton Windmill, London's last working windmill. I'm also descended from a long line of millwrights who made and repaired mills in Kent. You'll be meeting some of my fellow volunteers who will be puncturing the jolly Miller myth and showing how times of crisis have brought out the best in Millers, including our own group of volunteers at Brixton Windmill. We've all had a recent hard lesson on the vital importance of the supply of flour for our daily bread, or our daily pasta or chapati for that matter, and what happens when the supply is interrupted. It's worth saying that nowadays the pinch point is not always the flour itself, but the packaging it derives in, and panic buying exacerbates the problem, as we all know. Thousands of years ago, the ability to grow and grind wheat was at the root of many civilizations. More recently, shortages of flour have led to bread riots, even violent political change. And we'll be hearing more about that a bit later too. Just to give a potted history of Brixton Windmill, over 200 years ago, the owner of Stockwell Manor and its lands began selling off plots and leases to parts of his estate. One of the new tenants was John Ashby, our founder, who came from an extended family of millers and millwrights working in the southeast of England. They were Quakers, a faith group well known for their philanthropy. And we'll be returning to the significance of that later on. The mill was built in 1816 as a rural grain mill and stayed in the Ashby family through the generations for all its working life, up until the 1930s. This picture from Lambeth Archives shows the mill in 1841, when the surrounding area was beginning to be built up, and you can see the brick fields in the foreground. The mill has seen many ups and downs during its lifetime. In the 1860s, as the area became built up and robbed the windmill of wind, its sails were taken off and it ceased to function as a wind-powered mill. But unlike all the other mills in Lambeth, it survived because the Ashby family, who continued in the milling business, found a use for it for storage purposes. And at the beginning of the 20th century, the family installed the mill we use today, a modular mill which originally operated by steam power, then by gas, and now by electricity. To complete the story, Brixton Windmill has long been recognized as an important part of our industrial heritage. After being awarded the much sought after status of grade two star listed building, it was bought by Lambeth Borough Council in 1951 with help from London County Council. And there were major restorations in the 1960s and 1980s, aimed at opening it up to the public. Unfortunately, these were both followed by periods of neglect and disuse. In 2003, the Friends of Windmill Gardens were formed 
with the aim of restoring the mill again and running it on behalf of Lambeth Council, who own and maintain the, the mill. After restoration, the mill opened to the public for visits in 2011. And in 2015, thanks to a successful crowdfunding campaign, we, be we began milling again using the historic Modena mill, which has fine French burr stones, very different from the heavy grit stones of the old wind powered mill. We now have an active team of volunteer millers who supply flour to local shops and also sell it from our new Brixton Windmill Centre. Later on, we'll hear about the ways that mills throughout the UK have been coping with the COVID crisis. But before that, I want to show you a clip from BBC London News about Brixton Windmill's own activities during the pandemic. And on that note of how people and businesses have been rallying around to support their community, which is so uplifting. In Brixton, one of the area's best known landmarks has been working overtime to provide for shops, bakeries and local food banks. Alice van der Kravi has the story. This is Inner London's only working windmill, producing wholemeal flour with grain from a farm in Hertfordshire. The produce goes to shops and bakeries across South London, now more than ever. The health crisis has meant the windmill is closed to visitors, but mass producing for locals. We're helping out people in the area who want to get access to good quality ingredients um, and good flour that they can use to make healthy meals at home. Abs has been volunteering here for four years. We tend to get um, uh, maybe for 10 or 20 bags of flour at a time. Since the pandemic has hit, those orders have increased dramatically. We're looking at maybe 40 to 50 bags each time. We just got an order for 100 kilos of flour from a bakery in the local area. And they're spreading their flour to the local food bank too, where their bags are being added to the bags of essentials pre-packed for those in need. We formally, we allow the people to come into the hall and make their own choices. But because of the COVID-19, we've taken stringent measures and we bag them and then we take them out for them so that we can observe the social distancing. The bags of flour are certainly very welcome. Alice Bandu Kravi, BBC London, in Brixton. Hello, I'm Penny Steele, a volunteer at Brixton Windmill, which isn't the only mill that's been busy during the current pandemic, trying to meet the demand for flour. While traditional mills producing stone ground flour have had to close to visitors due to COVID-19, many mills from Altney to the Isle of Wight, from East Anglia to West Wales, were overwhelmed by the demand for flour in March this year, and where possible have responded by increasing production. Redbourne Berry Mill on the River Thur near St Albans is owned by the James family and volunteers assist with milling and mill maintenance. In normal times, it opens to the public and the on-site bakery and shop selling bread and flour opens on Saturday mornings. On Saturday the 21st of March this year, a queue began forming at 7am and was eventually over 50 yards long Park cars blocked local lanes. They sold nearly two tonnes of flour and their stock ran out by 10.30 a.m. They temporarily closed the shop to avoid further chaos, but were deluged by inquiries. Normally, they mill 750 to 1,000 kilos of flour per week, but increased this to three to five tonnes a tonne is a thousand kilos, so that's producing four to five times more than usual. This was mainly limited by their supply of grain, and Justin James said if they could mill 24 hours a day, they would still not have got close to meeting demand. They were milling at least three days a week and bagging flour in a socially distanced way at least five days a week and their bakery went from typically working two days a week to six. As you'll hear later in Lizzie's talk, 
At times of crisis, women often have to step into the breach. And one of Redbourne Berry's previous millers was a woman named Ivy Hawkins, who'd milled during both world wars. Her father was miller there, and her brother was killed in the First World War. She began working in the mill around 1916, when she was about 20 years old. After her father died in 1932, she and her mother inherited the tenancy of the mill, and she continued as miller on her own after her mother's death in 1944. She was featured in a Times newspaper article in 1959, which claimed she was England's only Lady Miller, and she lived at the mill until 1985. Foster's Mill, a tower windmill at Swatham Prior in Cambridgeshire, also received a huge increase in inquiries and orders. Their bakery customers all doubled their orders, and they had long queues for on-site flour sales. They decided to ration their different types of flour to three kilos per household, but also facilitated flour buying groups for local villages, where one person collected orders for neighbours and friends, and they made special arrangements for families who were shielding, leaving flour so it could be collected without human contact. Jonathan Cook, the master miller at Foster's Mill, says they were milling 30 to 35 tonnes a year, but this spring and summer they have milled between one and one and a half tonnes a week to cope with the extra demand. Customers at the weekly on-site shop have increased from about 10 to between 60 and 80 a week. Many traditional mills hope to retain their new customers when stocks of flour in shops and supermarkets return to normal. Warwick Bridge Corn Mill, a water mill near Carlisle in Cumbria, recently rescued from dereliction, is run by a community benefit society with the help of Breadshare, a social enterprise bakery. They were going to begin milling in June, but due to the flour shortage, they brought forward their plans and started milling in April to fulfil the local need. As I've been researching this topic, it's noticeable how most windmills and watermills rely on volunteers for milling and bagging flour or for mill maintenance. Holgate Windmill, a five sail tower mill near York, run entirely by volunteers, organised two teams to milk 200 kilos of flour a week, compared to 75 kilos pre-lockdown. They also had long queues at their weekly on-site shop and quickly sold out, but were able to double their production again. But many volunteers are in an older age group who shielded during lockdown. Charlcote Watermill on the Avon near Warwick ran during lockdown with the miller helped by just one volunteer. Almost overnight, demand for their flour increased several fold and they've been milling over three tonnes of wheat per week, more than double the usual quantity. North Leverton Windmill near Retford in Nottinghamshire is run by volunteers and they've been milling every week to supply local villages, community groups and those supporting the vulnerable as well as their regular customers. Local farmers have been supplying them with wheat and spelt and the volunteers milled more flour in 10 weeks than they did in the whole of last year. Interestingly, this windmill was built by a group of local farmers in 1813 as a subscription mill during the Napoleonic Wars at a time of fluctuating food prices and shortages. The mill was to grind corn not only for the members of the company, but also for other farmers and industrious poor persons at a fee decided upon by the directors. It's said to be the only windmill in the country 
that has been milling continuously since it was built. I believe it's still owned by relatives of the farmers who built it, and a charitable trust has now been set up to ensure the mill's survival. A number of subscription union or parish mills were established in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, often by societies or people concerned about the welfare of the less well-off to provide reasonable quality and reasonably priced flour. Typically, the miller of this type of mill charged a fixed fee instead of taking a toll or share of the flour as his pay, which often caused disputes. Alternatively, he charged a lower price to members of the society or the local community some days of the week and did commercially priced milling on other days. Many smaller mills didn't last very long, but some larger steam mills survived into the 1830s and were a kind of forerunner to the cooperative movement. Some mills that usually only mill for demonstration or educational purposes have also stepped up to the mark during the current pandemic. One such mill is Sturminster Newton Water Mill on the River Stour in North Dorset, which is part of a heritage trust with a museum and gallery. There has been a water mill on this site for over a thousand years. Usually, they only sell small quantities of flour as a souvenir for visitors, but with the mill close to the public and local shops running out of supplies, the two millers at Sturminster Newton decided to mill the wheat they had in stock. During April, they estimated they ground more than a tonne of grain and bagged several hundred sacks of flour, with three pound bags being sold at cost to a local grocer and baker. Proceeds went to the upkeep of the mill. Heach Windmill in Derbyshire is the only working six-sailed stone tower mill in England. Like Brixton Windmill, it's owned by the local authority and run by volunteers. They had a successful day's milling on Saturday the 21st of March and had a good supply of flour which they would usually sell at the mill or at local farmers markets. However, with lockdown, the trustees reluctantly decided to close the mill, as many of their volunteers are older and social distancing in the mill was difficult. They decided to donate their stock of flour to Belper COVID-19 Mutual Aid, who distributed it to local families in need. Heatherslaw Water Mill in Northumberland also up production of flour by 500%. The miller, Dave Harris Jones, also volunteers for Northumberland National Park Mountain Rescue. And during lockdown, he climbed the mill's 32 stairs, carrying a 20 kilo sack of flour 136 times, equivalent to the height of Chiviot the highest peak in Northumberland. He raised over a thousand pounds for the Mountain Rescue Charity. Increased production has put a strain on old buildings and machinery. Mill rights and mill maintenance volunteers have also been busy keeping things running. In 2011, I attended the From Crop to Crest conference. One miller, Nick Jones, spoke about how traditional mills powered by water or wind and not necessarily dependent on the national grid, often grinding locally grown corn, could play a vital part in supplying flour in times of crisis when food security might be threatened. Little did I guess how things would be in 2020. On a local note, Andy Forbes of Brockwell Bake, who was also at the conference, you can see his flower on the right, tells me he hasn't been milling this year. His mill is on rent to a bakery in Berkshire. Although it's estimated that traditional mills produce only 1% of flour milled in this country, 
This year's shortages have demonstrated that flour doesn't only come from large factories via supermarkets, and that today's millers do their best to respond to the needs of local communities. Much of the information on mills during the pandemic has come from Mill News, the SPAB Mill section newsletter, and from items on the Mills Archive website. I've also listed other sources in case anyone is interested to find out more. I'll now hand you over to our next speaker, Viv Whittingham. Hello. John Ashby, the first miller at Brixton Windmill, was a Quaker, and so were his children and his children's children. I'm Viv Whittingham. I volunteer for Friends of Windmill Gardens, and I'm one of his descendants. Four generations separate me from John. I'm not a Quaker myself, but I've got a great respect for their tradition of radicalism. You may associate Quakers or the Society of Friends, as they're more formally called, with breakfast cereals and milk chocolate because Quaker families started up Jacob's Biscuits and Bewley's Coffee, and the chocolate firms such as Fry's, Cadbury's, Terry's, Roundtree Macintosh. They also set up Lloyd's and Barclays banking houses, Clark's Shoes, Personal Automatic, and a whole host of other well-known household brands. But there were also milling dynasties, such as Pym, Robinson, Thale, and Sandwich. The Quaker movement itself was founded in the mid 1600s and was one of the very many radical religious movements that sprang up when everywhere in Europe there was war. They were unique because they abandoned the hierarchical structure of Roman Catholicism and the Church of England. And throughout their history, they stood out as local philanthropists and with other Quakers as reformers and campaigners. I'll give a few examples of this because I'll mention their role in the Irish famine, a notable campaigner for the repeal of the Corn Laws, and an Essex family of millers who helped out in times of cholera. I'll start with the Irish famine. The failure of the potato crop due to blight in 1846 had come on top of another failure the previous year. It was obvious that a major catastrophe was about to happen. Quakers, among them Quaker millers such as the Jacob family, based in Waterford, set up relief operations. Jacobs are best known for their biscuits, and milling brothers William and Robert produced the first cream cracker as, the ship's, as a ship's biscuit. In the autumn of 1846, Quaker men and women, a small minority in the country, set up soup kitchens and organised networks of relief employing their own strong networks in Ireland and in England. Donations of food and clothing and other emergency relief was replaced when other organizations stepped in and took over this role with more long-term aid in the form of loans to set up weaving, fishing and seed distribution. A model farm was set up then they set up a campaign to, set, to persuade the government to make major changes in the system of land tenure. They distributed nearly 8,000 tonnes of food, almost 300 soup boilers and around 80 tonnes of seed. Large numbers of people were given employment in agriculture, fisheries and industry, and more were taught to grow crops they hadn't come across before. This extensive relief was delivered by the Quakers, a religious body, but it was a strict condition that they did not push that down people's throats. It wasn't a condition of the distribution of that relief. Moving on, here's another notable Quaker, Jonathan Dodgson Carr. He was a Quaker miller and he founded the Carr's Flower bread and biscuit dynasty in Carlisle in June 1831. The waistcoat that you can see belonged to him. It's made of brown velvet and decorated with ears of wheat and the word free, focusing on his fight to repeal the Corn Laws. These Corn Laws were tariffs 
and other trade restrictions on imported food and grain. They were enforced in the UK between 1815 and 1846, and they kept the price of British wheat artificially high, and they impeded cheaper imports. It led to many ordinary people struggling to pay for their daily bread at times of poor harvest, and also to a lot of social unrest across the country. Carr organized public meetings in Carlisle at which nationally known speakers were invited to talk. He pressured the government to repeal the laws. He wore this waistcoat at any meetings he went to during the campaign. He was also an effective campaigner against slavery, and he helped establish water and gas supplies in Cumbria. Finally, we come to marriages. Since 1824, this firm has been producing quality flour. The marriages have been farmers and millers ever since they arrived in mid-Essex in the 17th century. They mill a wide range of flowers, organic varieties, and speciality flowers, including stone ground wholemeal flour. Local records show that during the first half of the 19th century, many deaths were due to illnesses like tuberculosis and dysentery. At the same time, new building developments exacerbated problems with the disposal of sewage. So when cholera broke out, there was a movement to address these health issues, and in 1850, a new board of health on which Thomas Marriage and John Marriage served actively set up effective sanitation and building standards. Cholera affected much of the UK in the 19th century. One of the Quaker millers at our own Brixton windmill, Aaron Ashby, died from cholera during the third cholera pandemic in 1854. He was one of John Ashby's children. John was a Quaker of firm convictions and Friends House on Euston Road has a number of the impassioned and learned pamphlets that he produced. Seeing firsthand the problems facing the dispossessed in the early part of the 19th century, he called for unused farmland to be given to the unemployed. Many of them were demobilized servicemen or laborers thrown off the land during recession. To finish up, there is much more to uncover in the role that Quaker millers had in difficult times. With their strong principles of non-violence, absolute truth and sexual equality, they were invariably drawn into campaigns and while their radicalism put them at odds with those in power, it bound them closer together. They were excluded from government posts, attending university and becoming MPs for many years. But they succeeded in industry and trade, building networks across the country, which served to help them achieve aims of increased social justice. That's the end of, of my bit, and I hand over now to Liz, the next speaker. Thank you. Hello, my name is Liz Dupark, and I'm a trustee and volunteer with the Friends of Windmill Gardens. I'm going to be talking to you about flour and bread in time of war. In the late 18th century, Britain produced enough food to feed the population and had enough grain to export. But during the 19th century, there was massive population increase. The repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846 led to cheaper imported wheat and a decline in arable farming. But the British developed a taste for white bread which was wasteful, so demand increased. Huge roller mills from the 1860s were putting traditional mills out of business. And in the top right of your screen, you've got a picture of the now derelict Millennium Mills 
at uh, Silvertown in London's Docklands, which were milling huge quantities of flour being imported into the Docklands. And bread factories were making, started making, for example, aerated bread from 1862, which, were, which was putting traditional bakers out of business. And in the bottom right of your screen, you can see an ABC cafe. ABC stat stood for the Aerated Bread Company. And this method used carbon dioxide to aerate the bread instead of yeast fermentation and kneading to leaven it and was cheaper, faster, and easier to automate. In 1850, there were between 12,000 and 15,000 traditional mills in the UK. By 1910, there were just 2,000. By 1914, over 80% of our grain was imported, much of it from the United States and this became very vulnerable to U-boat attacks. Many traditional wind and water mills became neglected and were declared unfit to mill flour for human consumption. We believe Ashby's Brixton mill kept production going during World War I and took great pride in the quality and health properties of its stone ground flour. Ashby's mill continued to produce a range of quality flour using its modular mill, the one we use today, right up until 1934. Here is the 1914 price list from Ashby's windmill, promoting its old fashioned stone ground flour and wheat meal, so much recommended by many leading men in the medical profession today. In World War I, the country's food supply was at risk. Farmers were asked to produce more cereals, but this would have cost more and no financial support was available. Young men were leaving the land to fight in the war. So very little was done during the first half of the war to increase food production. A major shortage of flour after a very poor harvest in 1916 led to the establishment of the Ministry of Food in December 1916. From 1917, the Ploughing Up campaign was a success, with about 2.5 million acres of pasture turned over to arable production. Allotments date from 1917 parks and even the gardens of royal palaces were ploughed up. Men working in agriculture had answered the call to arms in 1914 and were conscripted in 1916, leaving a dearth of labour on farms and in food production. Although women were eventually recruited to replace them, the Women's Land Army dated from 1917, Soldiers were being redeployed back to the land by 1917. And here we've got a very striking uh, poster for the Women's Land Army, God Speed the Plough and the Woman Who Drives It. And this of course was uh, the year before women, some women were first given the right to vote. Other steps to address the flower shortage included the setting up of the Wheat Commission to increase stocks of cereals and change composition of flour so bread would not need to be rationed. Additives included barley, oats, rye, soya and potato. Increasing the extraction rate, i.e. the percentage of the whole grain that went into the flour, from 76% in November 1916, that's white flour, to 81% in February 1917, similar to modern brown, and 92% in March 1918, close to wholemeal. People were encouraged to make their own wholemeal bread and to bulk it out with pre-cooked rice, sago, potatoes, Carico beans and barley. And people were encouraged to eat 
less bread. And here are two more uh, posters. The kitchen is the key to victory, eat less bread, save the wheat and help the fleet, eat less bread. The bread order of May 1917 prohibited the sale of bread that was less than 12 hours old. This was to reduce consumption by making it less appetizing, to make it easier to slice thinly, and so that bread could be baked in the daytime rather than nighttime, because it was safer for women bakery workers and saved fuel for lighting. National kitchens were established in 1917 to sell nutritious food at cost to the public. And here's another striking poster. Don't waste bread. Save two slices every day and defeat the U-boat. Rising food prices and reduced availability caused panic buying, hoarding, and accusations of profiteering. A voluntary rationing scheme from February 1917 encouraged a limit per person per week of four pounds of bread, cakes and puddings, about 1.81 kilo, two and a half pounds of meat, about 1.13 kilos, and three quarters of a pound of sugar, about 340 grams. Badges were printed with the words, I eat less bread. There was undoubtedly some malnutrition amongst poorer families, but on the whole, the population did not go hungry. And uh, here's another quite moving poster. I risked my life to bring you food, use it carefully, live on voluntary rations and win the war. Other measures and advice to avoid wasting food in World War I included to eat slowly and only when absolutely hungry, buying bread by weight, as the poor did, rather than by the loaf, a limit of two courses for lunch and three for supper if dining out, not to feed stray dogs, prohibiting the use of wheat, barley, etc., to feed animals, including working horses, and cookery demonstrations in shops, emphasizing the need to economize. Eating habits reverted to normal between the wars. In 1930, sliced wrapped bread appeared in the UK. By 1933, 80% of the bread in the US was pre-sliced and wrapped leading to the phrase, the best thing since sliced bread. In 1929, the benefits of wholemeal flour were first properly identified by scientists, but still did not change national preference for white bread. But for World War II, we were better prepared. Slicing and wrapping of loaves was prohibited until 1950. In 1940, calcium and vitamins were added to white flour to prevent rickets, which had been identified in women joining the Women's Land Army. And in 1942, the National Loaf made its appearance, made from 85% extraction flour. And this lasted until its abolition in 1956. And characters such as Potato Pete appeared in propaganda. Bread was not in fact rationed until July 1946. And here we've got a picture of a national loaf, quite brown as you can see. I make a good soup, says Potato Pete. Apart from the domestic flour shortage we experienced in Britain earlier this year, due to the wrong size flour bags, Wheat and flour shortages are a thing of the past in the UK. UK wheat production grew from 1.7 million tonnes in 1914 
to 2.4 million tons in 1918 and 11.9 million tons in 2013. We are now 83% self-sufficient in wheat compared with 19% in 1914. But there remains increasing food poverty in this country and war and climate change are still causing localized famines across our world. We have become very complacent and wasteful in this country in our attitude to food. British households throw away over 10% of their perfectly edible food. But what goes around comes around. Wholemeal flour is back in fashion and our trendy food shops and artisan bakeries in the 21st century offer us delicious breads and gluten-free products and cakes containing rice and potato flour, rye, buckwheat, semolina, oats, barley, carrot, even beetroot. And as we work our way through this pandemic, the friends of Windmill Gardens, the caretakers of Brixton's 204 year old windmill, are committed to promoting the benefits of wholemeal stone ground flour to a whole new generation of Lambeth residents and school children. Thank you. We're coming to the end of our talks and I wanted to take a minute to say a few more words about the Friends of Windmill Gardens who run Brixton Windmill and Brixton Windmill Centre. This picture symbolises the way we work as a community organisation. It was taken in 2016 at our annual Beer and Bread Festival, an important event for us. Sadly, the pandemic put a stop to our plans to hold the festival this year. But the community spirit remains an important part of our values and underlies everything we do. This year, we've continued to hold as many activities as we can, including milling, as we've heard, as well as a return of our guided tours for visitors. We've also been able to begin opening up our new Brixton Windmill Centre, which will be the base for our education programme and many other community events and activities. To find out more about the history of the windmill, about current plans and activities, and how to support us, our website, brixtonwindmill.org, is the place to go. So it only remains for me to thank you for being with us today and wish you, metaphorically, a fair wind on your journey home.